Thank you, choir. It's great to see if you will turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. And because we apparently had an extra hour to sleep this morning, we had a lot more people at 930 than normal. So we've run out of bulletins. We have some. If you didn't get a bulletin when you came here, raise your hand. Uh, and so, okay, we got a lot who need bulletins. Keep your hands raised. The, the ushers are, um, are bringing those around. We want to make sure everybody has one. As you're turning in your worship guide, you'll see that there is a insert there on month of missions. Now, we really need to call it the almost month of missions because we're focusing for three weeks, not the entire month. But each week, we're going to look at a uh, pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy adoption agency. Each week, we're going to look at a global mission project and a local mission project. You can see this week we're highlighting and featuring the Accept Pregnancy Center. It's one that our church has been involved in for a long time, and, and many of you have been there and, and helped out there. They have a display in the foyer. We would love for you to go find out more about the Accept Pregnancy Center and what they're doing. Uh, a part of our month of missions offering that we take up will go to the Accept Pregnancy Center our goal this month, or these three weeks, is to raise 5000 for some of these special uh, ministries. The second you see there, it's actually at the top, is the women's shelter. This is a part of the, the, um, uh, the homeless uh, center. And uh, we have three groups you can see there who are involved in ministry there. We went Friday night and uh, went and fed the lady, fed the families, and um, but some of our ladies helped do manicures along with uh, another group and then did projects with the kids. And it was just a great time. And I tell you, you walk away blessed being there and doing that. Uh, so there's a table set up with more information on the women's shelter. You can either go with one of these three groups or you can get uh, a group of your own and set up another time to go. And then Burundi. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Burundi. And when we did month of missions, we put aside that, you know, 10% of the one project is going to go to Burundi. We went through some red tape we weren't expecting, but all of that's now been taken care of. We're surveying the, the spot where we're going to build the church. We should be uh, building, starting the building of the church this month. And in the meantime, there's been a residential village that's basically been built right next to our project. So the day we opened up the church, now we have an instant congregation that we didn't have six months ago. So God's working it all out, and it's exciting to see, yeah, what's happening there. We uh, talked about this when we were looking at the sermon series. Is it too early to talk about the stress of the season? And here's what you know. You walk into any store, and what do you see? Christmas decorations everywhere, right? And, and so here's what we know. These next two months are going to be incredibly stressful times for many people. Uh, and and I, I kind of thought about this. There's at least five different stresses that are kind of unique to this season that I got to think about. One of those is there is a family stress this time of year. And here's, here's why it's unique this time of season, because everybody in your family has a different vision about what the season should be like, right? If you have teenagers, I get to sleep in till 1 o'clock and then play video games the rest of the day, right? Or if they're younger, we're going to go to the park every day that we're out on vacation. Uh, mom has a different vision. Mom's vision is, I can't wait till all the family's gathered around the table. We're going to sit there and we're going to talk and we're going to be there for hours just enjoying everybody's company. We're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. It's going to be an incredible time together. All the TV, everything's going to be turned off and it's going to be a great time. That's mom's vision, right? Dad's vision is, I'm getting a plate sitting in front of the TV watching football. I mean, you know. So everybody has their own vision, which brings stress to this time of year. Not only is there family stress, but there is shopping stress. Who do you buy a gift for? Do you buy a gift for your aunt, you know, Martha? Do you buy a gift for the people at your office? And then when you determine who you're going to buy gifts for, then what are you going to get them? And, and so there's this whole pressure of making sure that you get the right gift for the right people and all that. That leads to financial stress. 
uh, Gallup did a survey that said that last Christmas that the average family in America spent $716 on gifts for their immediate family alone. And some of y'all are thinking, man, that's cheap, right? But anyway, some of you go, that's a lot. But set, that's just for what you get for your immediate family. That's not counting all of the extra you spend for decorations, for Thanksgiving feasts, for food, for uh, travel, whatever else. That's just gifts. And so we're going to spend more money these next couple months than we normally spend. And that also leads to travel stress. You got to make, make the decision. Do we go to the in-laws or the outlaws? Do we stay here? Do we fly? Do we drive? Are our kids coming to see us? You know, uh, I, I hadn't told this in any other store, in any other services, so you're the only one who's going to get this. Heard about the, the um, guy who called his, his daughter up and said, honey, after 50 years of marriage, your mom and I are calling it quits. I just can't stand her anymore. She can't stand me. And, uh, and we're, we're just calling it quits and, and just wanted to let you know. And the daughter's just upset. And she says, Dad, d no way. Don't do anything. I'm going to call my brother. We're going to be there in a couple. We're going to talk this out. Y'all can work this out. I promise you. We're going to be there to help. And so the daughter hangs up the phone. And the dad turns to mom and said, the kids are coming for Thanksgiving. They're paying their own way. Okay? <laughs> so there's there's... I wish I had thought about that one yesterday. So anyways, there's travel stress. And then there's the one I, I struggle with, and that is the eating stress, amen? I mean, come on. Every party you go to, there's all kind of food laid out there, the big Thanksgiving meal, all of the, uh, you know, leftovers from that, Christmas. And I mean, it's just, we're going to pack on the pounds the next couple of weeks. And, and all of that, you know, just increases our stress level. And here's what I want to say about stress. It's ungodly. Stress is the opposite of faith. Stress is basically saying either I know I'm not giving God enough control or I don't think God can handle it. Because the Bible tells us to be anxious about nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make our requests known to God. And yet, here's what I also know. We're not all sanctified yet. We're going to struggle with stress this time of year. And a result of that stress is some actions and some emotions that are going to come out. And we're specifically going to drill down on seven of those over these next seven weeks. And hopefully we're going to let God's word speak to us about some of these habits, some of these actions that are just exasperated by the stress that, of the season and, and this season maybe is going to be a little bit more peaceful and joy-filled uh, than, than maybe the, the previous seasons. And so today we're going to look specifically at the issue of anger. And, and we're going to kind of drill down and let God's word speak to us about anger. And as soon as I say that, some of y'all know that God's going to nail you today. Because you know you struggle with that. In fact, there's some of you right now who are angry at the fact that Alabama didn't get a kicker on their team, right? <laughs> I mean, you're just struggling with that. You, you didn't want to come see me today because of your anger, right? So we're going to let God's word speak to us about anger. Yahoo did a survey and asked people what they were angry about. And I love some of the answers. Uh, kids misbehaving in public with their parents seeming oblivious to it. Being cut off in traffic makes me angry. Rude people makes me angry. When my spouse squeezes the toothpaste from the middle, that makes me angry. People who talk on their cell phones while driving. Slow drivers in a fast lane. People who talk at the movie theater. Politics. Low riding pants. When someone gets in the 10 item or less lane at the grocery store with 11 items or more. And then somebody actually put down mayonnaise. Makes me angry, okay? <laughs> but then there's all of those that we would agree with that are serious. Sexual abuse. Racism. Violence. War poverty, and justice. Here's what you need to know. All of us get angry. And here's why. Because God gave you the emotion of anger. And if God gave it to you, then that means it's not all bad. 
In fact, the fact that God gave us anger, here's what we need to understand. There are two kinds of anger. There is a righteous anger that leads to righteous acts. And then there is a sinful anger that leads to destructive acts. Fifteen times in the Bible, anger and fire are used in the very same verse, which is so appropriate because they're so much alike. Fire can be really good. Fire purifies, fire cooks, fire heats. But fire can destroy in an instant. That's the same way with anger. There have been people who have gotten angry at social causes and brought about great reforms that have made people's lives better. But then there's an anger that has led to rage and senseless killing. You see, the issue is not anger. The issue is, why am I angry, and how do I deal with that anger? Question for you before we go any further that I want you to think about, and that's this. Are you, in your anger, giving Satan a guest room in your heart? Now, you can't be possessed by Satan if you're a Christian, but you can be oppressed by Satan and you can be used by Satan even if you're a Christian. So are you giving Satan a guest room in your heart through your anger? Even though we're going to look at Genesis 4 in just a minute, look at the top of your notes there at Ephesians 4, and it's a verse we're all familiar with. And it says this, in your anger, do not sin. Now, notice it doesn't say don't get angry. It says, in your anger, don't sin, because there's two kinds of anger. There's a righteous kind of anger, getting angry at something that angers the heart of God, and we call that sanctified anger. And then there's a sinful anger, an anger that makes you do something sinful. But here's the trick. You can have righteous anger and deal with it in a sinful way. And so that's where we need discernment and wisdom from God. Scripture says, in your anger, do not sin and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, in that verse, where have we always tended to apply that verse? In the context of what? Marriage, right? Which is a great verse for marriage. That was one of the first things my future father-in-law told me. You know, you're going to get angry. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And Gina and I have tried to apply that. The early years, there were a lot of sleepless nights, but we tried to apply that in our marriage, right? But understand this, that verse is not written in the context of marriage. That That verse is about anger, period, and with every relationship. The, the verse there says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Which means, yes, anger is an emotion that God gives us to tell us something's not right. But then we are to immediately do something about it. And if we are unable to do anything physically about it at that moment, we then pray and ask for discernment and wisdom. And we determine what steps we're going to take. Otherwise, we're giving Satan a guest room in our heart. He says that at the end, and do not give the devil a foothold. That word foothold there is the Greek word topos, which literally means room, location. Don't give the devil a room in your heart through your anger, a location to work through you because of your anger. And scripture is full of so many examples of anger and and the destructiveness of it. But I ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 4. Now remember, we're first generation into creation here. We're, We're four chapters into the Bible. And look at the role anger plays and how destructive it is. Starting in verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very what? Angry, and his face was downcast. Here's what's going on. We're getting a glimpse into one of the very first worship services that we see. The two brothers, they're going to go out and worship together. And the two brothers know you don't go to worship without an offering. Let me repeat that again. The two brothers understood you don't go to worship without an offering, right? 
And so they brought their offering. But here's what 1 John and Hebrews tells us about this. Abel came with a worshipful heart. Cain came out of obligation. Cain gave begrudgingly and out of obligation. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And so when they brought their offerings, God said, Abel, way to go. I accept your worship. Cain, not so much. You need to work on your heart. So we keep going. It says, verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you, what, angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Now, don't miss this. We're going to come back to it. But you must master it. So God says, look, Cain, why are you holding on to this anger? If you will just do what is right, if you'll come with a worshipful heart, everything's okay. But because of this sin, you have given, the, you have given Satan a toe post. You've given him room. And you need to master your anger. Keep going. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The first murder recorded, first murder ever, was because of anger. Anger can be incredibly destructive. And so, wrong ways to handle your sinful anger. Here's, here's what I know in the room. There are two kinds of people. There are those who we're going to call spewers, okay? Whenever you get angry, man, you have a short temper, and everybody knows you're angry. You have a short fuse. You have a hot temper, and you just express it. You're a spewer, and you get it out there, and, uh, and it's just a, you let everybody know how you feel. Nobody ever has to question how you feel, right? Because you just lose your temper, and it's out there. How many in here would just honestly say, I mean, we're in church, we can tell the truth, okay? How many would honestly say, and your, your spouse knows, and your friends know, are you a spewer? Raise your hand, raise your hand. I see that hand, David Reed, I see that hand. All right, raise your hand. Okay, some of y'all, you know it, but you're just kind of doing this, right? You're a spewer. Well, guess what the Bible says about spewers? You're foolish. Man, and some of you are happy to raise your hand now, right? Look what the Bible says here in Proverbs 29. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. One time, Billy Sunday, the evangelist, preached on anger, and after he preached on anger, a lady came up to him and he said, she said, Dr. Sunday, when I get angry, I just get it out. I just blow up, and then it's all over. And Dr. Sunday looked at that lady and he said, so does a shotgun. It just blows up, then it's all over. But it does incredible damage. And here's what the Bible says about spewers. And here's what we understand. It's foolish. Why is it feel foolish? Because if I just spew it out, I can never take it back. And anything that I've said, I can say I didn't mean it, but it's already out there. And I need to control myself and, and keep that under control because we can do incredible damage when we spew our anger. Proverbs 14, 17, a quick-tempered man does foolish things and a crafty man is hated. Several years ago, I remember the story. Just, I always remember the story. I read about a man who had road rage. He was on the highway. He felt like somebody cut him off. And so he determined he was going to cut them off. And in his road rage, he went around that car, and he went to cut them off. They went off the highway, hit a tree, and it was a family of four, and three of them were killed instantly when they hit the tree, mom and dad and the youngest child. The man who had road rage was a younger man with two preschoolers at home, probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison because a moment of spewing his anger. And he kept him, he didn't keep it under control. Kids are going to grow up without a father in the house because dad couldn't control his anger. That's why the Bible says it's foolish. And let me tell you, the Bible does not throw around the word fool very much. And it's really cautious when it does. 
but it's foolish to spew our anger. Some of you, your anger is destroying some of the most important relationships in your life. So we have spewers, but then the opposite of that is we have stewers. They're the ones that just bottle it up and they stew on it for a while. They suppress it. David said this in Psalm 32, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And instead of talking out and dealing with it, you hold it in, which is just the opposite of love. We looked at it a couple weeks ago. Love keeps no record of wrongs, but stewards keep long lists of wrongs. They give the silent treatment. They don't talk. If you're married and you're married to a steward, you know when they're stewing. Because when you go to bed... They face the opposite position, the opposite way. They ball up almost in the fetal position, and you know there's this neutral zone. You better not cross, right? Because if you do, don't touch me, you know, kind of deal, right? It, these stewards, and, and, and here's what Scripture says, that is equally as foolish. We see that in the story of the prodigal son. And you know about the prodigal son, a young foolish guy came, comes to his dad and said, I want my inheritance now, give it to me. He gets half of his dad's inheritance. He goes and he, and he spends it in, in fast living and wild women, and he doesn't have anything left. He comes begging home back to dad and said, I'll be your servant, I'll work for you. Dad rejoices that a son he thinks he's never going to see before, again has now come home and he throws this big party. And everybody's in there rejoicing over the fact that the young son has come home, except for the older brother. Look in your notes, Luke 15. The older brother became what? Angry and refused to go in. He just stood outside and stewed. And dad went out and said, son, don't you understand everything I have is still going to be passed down to you? Don't you understand the son of mine was dead and now he's alive? Your brother, we thought we'd never see him again, and he's here. Come on in. Let's rejoice. But he wouldn't. He stood outside and continued to stew. And in doing so, he was giving the devil a topos, giving the devil a room to use him in destructive and evil ways. So what should I do with my anger? Well, it all depends. Is it a sinful anger or is it a sanctified anger? In your sinful anger, the Bible's very clear, put it out. Thinking about the fire illustration, just put it out. Look at Proverbs 17, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Just let it go. Yeah, but you don't understand. Look, just drop it. Then they're going to get away with it. Just drop it. Let it go. I can't control my anger. Oh, yes, you can. And let me prove to you you control your anger. I know you've never done this, but you've heard about other couples who fight, you know, and going back and forth. And here's what's going on. Yelling at each other, right? I can't believe, and you're such an, and if you ever, and if I ever, and, all, and the phone rings, right? And it goes from, if you ever... Well, hey, how are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, bless your soul. Yeah, we plan on being there. Yeah, amen. Yeah, here's what we're going to bring. Looking forward to it. See you later. Bye. Right? In an instant, you have changed your behavior. In fact, some of you came to church this morning stewing. You were stewing for the fact that you had an hour extra to, to sleep in, and you still showed up late, right? And you were stewing at your spouse for running late this morning and, and all. But the moment you got out of the car and you saw somebody in your small group, hey, praise the Lord, how are you doing? Man, everything's great. Did you see the game last night, right? Why? Because you have control of your anger. God told Cain, you must master it. Well, how do we master it? Well, we get insight in your notes in James 1, 19 and 20. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become what? Angry, for a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. There are seven different books in the Bible who say over and over, God is slow to anger, but abounding in love. So how do I deal with sinful anger? I become more Christ-like. I draw closer to God. And the more I'm like him, the more I will be slow to anger 
and abounding in love. So if it's sinful anger, let it go. It really doesn't matter. So your spouse is always 10 minutes late. Let it go. You're not going to change her anyway. Let it go, right? So he always, I didn't hear that. That's a good thing, all right? He always loads the dishwasher wrong. Let it go. It's going to get hot enough. It's going to clean up. You know, just let it go. Now, here's the one that gets me. If they put the toilet paper coming from the back, because every saved, sanctified you know, child of Christ knows it's supposed to come over from the top. All right? It is definitely sinful and of the devil to come from the bottom. It's supposed to come over the top. But you know what? You got to let it go, right? How do you let it go? Become more like Christ, and you'll be slow to anger and abounding in love. So for sinful anger, put it out. For sanctified anger, fan the flame. Fan the flame. Mark chapter 3, we see the story of Jesus in the synagogue. And there's a man there with a shriveled hand. And Jesus is about to heal that man, but he looks over his shoulder and he sees the religious heat and he knows what they're going to do. The moment he heals them, they're going to accuse him of working on the Sabbath because it was against the Jewish law to even heal on the Sabbath. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 5 in your notes. He looked at them in what? Anger. Well, let's do that one again. <laughs> He looked at them and anger. did Jesus get angry? Absolutely. Absolutely. He looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. You see, that's sanctified anger. Jesus was angry, but it didn't lead him to sin. It, left him, it led him to do good to heal, to do a righteous act. And here's how I see Satan using anger. He gets us angry over the things that ultimately really don't matter. And he keeps us from getting angry at the stuff that we should be angry about. In fact, this week I wrote down a list of things I'm angry at. I'm, I got a ton of bottle up stuff. I'm angry, right? So here's some things I'm angry at. I'm angry at marriages that are falling apart and, and that Satan has gotten a foothold and people are talking about splitting up homes with kids. I'm angry at that. And we're going to do everything we can to pray for marriages and to support marriages and to challenge people and hold them accountable. I'm angry. I'm angry at poverty. Every time I go to Africa, I am just amazed at how little they have. And so in a couple weeks, this church is going to be sending a couple hundred thousand meals to Africa uh, in a cargo bin. Because we're going to do something righteous with that anger. I'm angry at the abortion industry that calls it a choice and acts like it's no big deal. And so for the month of missions, each week we're gonna focus on a crisis pregnancy and an adoption agency. I'm angry that every day people are dying and going to a Christless eternity. Open up the obituary when you get home and here's what we know, most of those pictures you see there have slipped into a Christless eternity. And because of that, we're not going to cater to the spoiled saints, but we're going to be on mission to reach people for Christ and do everything short of sin to do what God has called us to do, and that is to be light and salt in this community and to reach people with his love. I'm angry at those who teach and preach lies under the banner of Christianity. And so we're going to unapologetically preach and teach truth, even if it gets people mad. Because God's word is truth, and in it is life. 
And so here's my prayer. May we be a church that decreases and diminishes in sinful anger. But may we also be a church that increases in sanctified anger. Let's pray together.